My topic today is entitled, God Reigns. And we'll be eventually studying Psalm 93, which is about the Lord reigning. But for my introduction today, which is rather lengthy, um, I just wanted to remind us that the, and I'm sure you're all aware, that the five, 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation is rapidly approaching. Martin Luther unwittingly started the Protestant Reformation on October 31st, 1517. We as Bible Presbyterians follow in the line of the founders of the Reformation, who at their core uh, beliefs that shaped the establishing of several denominations, you know, the Anglicans, Cramner, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Luther himself, the Congregationalists, Puritans, the Pilgrims, Cotton, Owen, Goodwin, among others, and especially above for we Bible Presbyterians, Calvin and Knox. Now, there are obvious differences which led to the founding of these different denominations. Differences in church government, differences in, in using a litany or not. But they all held in common what we would call the fundamentals of the faith, which included the inspiration and, in, and inerrancy of the scripture, the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the virgin birth of our Lord, the substitutionary atoning work of Christ on the cross, and Jesus' physical resurrection and his personal bodily return to come. All these men were also essentially Calvinistic in their beliefs. They were all re what we would call Reformed. Another anniversary is approaching. Did you know it would be 60 years at the end of October when we first entered this building? Doesn't have anything to do with my sermon, but it is another anniversary that's approaching. We use words like Reformed, Biblical, Bible-believing, Calvinistic, and we use them interchangeably. And well, we should. The great Baptist Calvinist Charles Spurgeon said, it's a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. So why should we care that 500 years ago some monk nailed up some 95 theses on a church door? What's it have to do with us today? Well, that Calvinistic theology should frame how we think. Because that Calvinistic theology is the theology of the Bible. Did you know that Calvinists greatly shaped the founding of America? Both the Puritans and the Pilgrims were reformed. At the time of our war for independence, 85% of the population were, had a Calvinistic heritage. English Puritans, Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, in this area German and Dutch Reformed. King George III himself called our American Revolution that Presbyterian Rebellion. The writing of the Constitution. You know, they say... We say that James Madison was the father of the Constitution, and well, he was in many ways. Did you know that James Madison spent two years after he finished his, his college education, two years being tutored by the great Presbyterian seminarian and preacher, Witherspoon? When we look at our founding documents, we see reformed principles, principles gleaned from the Bible, the rule of law, limited government, a worth ethic, education, free markets. All these ideas came from thinkers who were profoundly affected by the doctrines of grace. Calvin was called the virtual founder of America. Our founding fathers thought theologically and, they, and we're still being blessed by the results. 
I mentioned what we believe should affect what we think, the way we live. Our theology should produce practical results. The Bible is our ultimate standard, but we believe that the Westminster Confession of Faith rightly divides this word of truth. It's a Calvinistic document. What is Calvinism? Well, perhaps we've heard uh, the brief summary of Calvinism. There's much more to it, but you might have heard the acronym TULIP. It's a system of doctrine that encompasses more than that summary, but the beliefs that are shown there should encourage our walk in Christ. Because TULIP is an expression of the sovereignty of God. That's what the Reformation is really about. The sovereignty of God. Our salvation is all of God. Sola Scriptura, sola grace, sola gratia, sola only grace, sola fidelis, only faith. Sola Deo Gloria. All the glory to God alone. He's the king. So let's look at these various points. T stands for total depravity. Human beings are completely tainted by sin. Our hearts, our will, our emotions, our minds, our bodies all suffer under the curse of sin. Humanity is not equally sinful, nor is, nor is humanity as sinful as it could be due to the mercy of God and his grace. But according to the larger catechism, humanity is utterly disposed, indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all that is spiritually good and wholly inclined to all evil, and that continually. Wow. That's a pretty pessimistic outlook for humanity, isn't it? Well, the Bible shares that view. Ephesians, read Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, if you don't believe me. It tells us that we're dead in trespasses and sin. Yet this viewpoint fundamental to understanding who we are and who God is and what he's done. In the book of Jeremiah, we read that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know them? You know, we like to depend on ourselves. We like to think we're making our own decisions. And, and how often do we say, after we've made a decision, well, it was my gut. I, you know, it's my... I just felt this was the right thing to do. Our gut, our emotions, our feelings can deceive us. Do we always feel saved? If we've trusted the living Christ, if we understand the doctrines of the doctrines of grace. We don't need to worry about feeling saved. We either are or we are not. We have either trusted God and taken him at his word, or we have not. We need to remember our hearts can deceive us. That word uh, wicked means to be weak, frail, sick, along with being evil. The, heart trans the word translated deceitful in Hebrew, or from the Hebrew, can refer to being sly, insidious, and slippery. So when we're making decisions in our lives, should we, dis should we trust the insidious, slippery heart? Or the glorious God? Well, the answer is obvious. But how often do we rely on our frail, slippery, insidious inner beings? We need to rely on the God of the Bible and his word. You know, it gets worse. Romans 6.20 tells us that outside of Christ, we are slaves to sin. Romans 3.10-12 tells us that unsaved people will not seek God and cannot seek God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the unsaved cannot understand spiritual things. And Ephesians 3.12 tells us that before we were saved, we were at war with God. And more frighteningly, he was at war with us. We were enemies. 
Yet God, the Son, gave his life for his enemies. So T for total depravity, U for unconditional election. The Bible teaches that God chose individuals to be saved before the foundation of the world, before an even a single atom was created. He did not choose us because of anything we had done or thought. We didn't exist. You know, there are those who say, well, God knew who was going to come to him. Our Arminian friends. Not so. God chose us before he made us. If he chose us because he knew we were going to choose him, isn't that a kind of a weak God? God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. Salvation is all of God. He's the one who draws us. He's the one who gives us grace that we might have faith. It's not for anything we've done. Check out Ephesians chapter 1. Here's the one that really makes some people not like us. Because we believe in limited atonement. Jesus died for his sheep, he says, not for the goats. It's a part of our theology that offends so many, and yet the Bible absolutely teaches this. Christ died for the elect. Remember, Dr. McIntyre explained this doctrine this way. The blood of Christ was sufficient to wash away the sins of all, but efficient only for the elect. God loved the entire world, but God only washed away the sins of the elect. Irresistible grace. The elect will hear and respond, so, uh, excuse me, I, irresistible grace, the elect will hear and respond to the call of God. Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Again, our salvation is all of God. It's the Father who draws us. It's Jesus who redeems us. It's the Holy Spirit who regenerates us. Lastly, P stands for perseverance of the saints. Because our salvation is all of God, we cannot lose our salvation. We're eternally secure. These essentials ought to shape our lives, our thoughts, our deeds. We can take this tulip and put it together in a different way as well. Put it into three parts. Our sovereign God, human depravity, and sovereign grace. So let me continue to develop these ideas just a bit. God is sovereign. This is the doctrine for which Calvinism is truly known, the sovereignty of God. God is reigning over all he hath made, all of history, and, the dec and decrees and determines all that comes to pass. Isaiah 45, 1 through 7, the Lord is speaking. He says the very same himself. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed Cyrus. Now Cyrus was the king of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth at that time. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. It was God who allowed Cyrus to be this powerful. It was God who allowed him to conquer other nations and caused him to do so. Because he had a plan. God has an eternal plan, and Cyrus fit into that. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee, speaking to Cyrus, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden ridges of secret places. The various kings think, well, Cyrus may conquer us, but he won't find our, our treasure. We'll hide it away. No, God's going to reveal it. Why? What, what was God's purpose? That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. This was written hundreds of years before Cyrus was born. He knew Cyrus before he was born. 
He called Cyrus by name. Why did he do that? For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. I have even called thee by name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord. There is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. God's saying, I'm the creator. I'm the sustainer. Nothing comes to pass unless it's through my decree. Our shorter catechism puts it this way. Short Catechism question number seven. What are the decrees of God? The decrees of God are his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Whatsoever comes to pass. If I trip down the steps, God foreordained that. God foreordained that you would be sitting here today. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Psalm 33.11 The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. His thoughts, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. What's God saying here? He says, I make peace and create evil. I bring you well-being. I bring you calamity. Our God is in charge of it all. Now we need to be careful here because the Bible also clearly teaches that the Lord is not the author of evil, the author of sin. But God does allow evil to occur in this sin-cursed world. And yet our Lord is even in the midst of national tragedies, like what occurred in Las Vegas. Our God is both great and good. He's sovereign. He rules over all, or he is not God at all. The problem of suffering is answered by God being both great and good. You know, you might ask the question, why does a good God allow evil if he hates it? Why does a great God allow evil when he can stop it? Well, the answer is because all of this was part of his plan. God foreknew Las Vegas was going to occur and allowed it to occur anyway. Now, I wouldn't be saying this to someone who had suffered tragedy there. But it was either part of his plan or God is not sovereign. And in a way, this can give us comfort because in our suffering, we know that God is indeed in it, that God has a purpose in it. Now that in itself isn't very comforting. What comforts us is that God is good. His mercy endureth forever. God is great. God is all-powerful. Somehow, even tragedy in our lives God has promised that he will indeed work it together for his, our good and his glory it has purpose and meaning even the crucifixion of our Lord was performed by human agents the most heinous act that ever has occurred in history the creature killing the creator was part of his plan. It's one of the scripture proofs we have in our catechism. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, which thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together 
for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. God had a greater purpose in the death of our Lord, didn't he? That we might have life and life eternal. That we might have life and that abundant. That we might forever have pleasures at his right hand. Human depravity. Of course, our fallen nature plays a role in the outworking of God's plan. The man-man who, who slaughtered all those people. He made a decision. He decided to kill that day. He's responsible for it. He can't claim, oh, well, it was your plan. I, I had no, no other course. I had to do it. No. Our depravity plays a role in the suffering that is on this earth. In Ecclesiastes, in chapter um, 9, verse 3, Solomon described our condition as the hearts of the son of men being full of evil. Madness is in their heart while they live. Read Ephesians chapter 2. You'll find that apart from God, we're dead, hopeless, hellish, and helpless. The third area in which we could fit these other five points is sovereign grace. Sovereign grace. And yet Calvin called this in Latin the decretum horribla. The horrible decree. And I remember struggling as a teenager over you know, the idea of election, reprobation. Started realizing all the implications of it. You know, that God has chosen some for eternal life, the sheep, and some to damnation, the goats. And yet no one will be able to stand before the great white throne and say, you know what? You can't throw me in the lake of fire. Who made me reject you? No. The Bible clearly teaches that there is human responsibility. Now this could be the topic of an entire sermon or a series of sermons. We can't truly explain it. And you know what? The Bible doesn't try to explain it. Paul, when he talks about this idea of election and reprobation, he doesn't try to explain it. In fact, we cannot. Our minds are finite. God's mind is infinite. How can these opposing things both be true and yet the Bible plainly teaches it? That's a conclusion I had to make all those eons ago when I was a teenager. I don't understand it completely, but the Bible clearly teaches it. For example, we learned when we, as Pastor Spencer was going through Exodus, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and yet God holds, held Pharaoh accountable for his actions. We read that no man comes to Jesus unless the Father draws him, and yet we also read that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Somehow the Father is going to draw every one of the elect to be saved. Calvinists don't try to reconcile these because we cannot. Spurgeon put it this way. He said, why reconcile friends? Election, reprobation. The result should drive us to worship the God, worship our God, for the greatness of his sovereign grace. If you would turn with me to Psalm 93. The Lord reigneth. He hath clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established, that it cannot be moved. Notice the Lord there is all capital letters. Jehovah reigns. Yahweh reigns. Jehovah rules. He's pictured here as being clothed in majesty. That is, He's arrayed in grandeur. This divine sovereignty is such that it should fill our minds and our spirits with awe, with wonder. Again, it should drive us to worship. It also says, in, in, besides being clothed in 
majesty and honor. It says that he's also girded in strength. Our majestic Lord, by the way, Yahweh is the one who makes covenants with his people. He's the promise-keeping God. He's the great I Am. Our majestic I Am is omnipotent. The King is all-powerful. His sovereignty extends to all of creation, including us. As creator, he has the right to do it. Do with it and with us whatever he wishes. If our world is stable, it's because of God. If we trusted him, we can confidently continue to trust him, even if our lives are shaken. Psalm 46 says that even if the mountains are removed into the midst of the sea, he still our refuge and strength, our very present, our omnipresent, our always present, the everywhere present help in trouble. Verse 2, thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting. Earthly rulers come and go, but our God and therefore his throne, that is his authority, are eternal. God is sovereign. His throne is eternal. Our infinite Jehovah knows the end from the beginning. The world is established, this verse says. It's firm underneath our feet. Our lives in him are established. His authority is established. That is everything. Our lives, this world, the universe, are under his control. Even if he allows calamity to come into our life, it will not prevail over us. We are eternally secure in him. What did Paul say? I'm persuaded in neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things to come, things above, things beneath. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Why? Because he loved us first. What does John say? We love him because he loved us first. Verse 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their waves. The forces of evil and chaos are often pictured as a troubled sea or floodwaters. We've certainly seen the power of water and storms in the last few weeks, haven't we? Three major hurricanes the devastating results that they cause. Well, as dangerous as those hurricanes are, we face greater danger than that. We have an enemy who's going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan, the devil, and his minions they're roaring like an angry sea. I think most of you have been to the shore. I know some of you are Ocean City people like me. I'm sure you've at some time or another been caught by a wave when you weren't expecting it and you know the results. Your feet go out from under you and you go flying, tumbling, out of control. Well, Satan and his minions, the demons, the world and, the fle- and our very flesh can cause chaos in our lives. God is not the author of chaos. God is a God who desires order. They're constantly on the attack with eternal consequence. But we need not fear. Look at the next verse. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. Yea, than mighty waves of the sea. Psalm 65, 4 through 13 tells us about God's answers, answer to the forces of chaos. Tells us about another kind of water. 65, verse 4, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee. Did you notice? Blessed is the man whom thou chooseth. Sounds like election to me, right there in the Old Testament. And causes causes to approach unto thee. Chooseth, causeth, for what purpose? That he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house 
even of thy holy temple. Wow, I think I can find tulip right in that verse. By terrible things in righteousness will thou answer us. Terrible, awesome, in this case. Our God, O God of our salvation. Who's our Savior? Who's the one who brings it to himself? Our God, Elohim, the creator of the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are far off upon the sea? When trouble comes, we can still have confidence in the eternal God. Why? Verse 6, which by his strength set fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas. Jesus can still the voice of Satan in our lives. Jesus can calm the effects of the angry seas of chaos in our lives. He gave us a physical example, didn't he? They were off in the, the key and the disciples were off in the Sea of Galilee. Galilee, he fast asleep. The storm arose. The sea was in chaos. What did he do? He said, peace, be still. Dead calm. Complete peace. Our God is all powerful. He stills the noise of the seas, the noise of the waves, and the tumult of the people. They also dwell in the uttermost parts, are afraid of thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waters with it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Well, there's a contrast. The chaos of the sea, and yet there's a river that comes from God. Full of living water. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit, but it's also a picture of a literal river that will flow from the throne of God, from which we will freely drink. Tree of life growing up beside it. Different fruit every season, every month. Thou preparest them corn, which thou hast so provided. God will meet all of our needs, both now here on earth and in eternity in heaven and on the new earth. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. God's providence is acting even today, making it rain and making crops grow, meeting needs of both the elect and the non-elect in his mercy. Thou settlest the furrows thereof, thou makest it soft with showers, thou blessest the spring thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and the paths drop fatness. That sounds like right now. They drop down upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks, and the valleys are covered with, over with corn. They shout for joy, they also sing. Is there a song in our hearts? Do we shout for joy? Or are we caught in the humdrum of this life? It's easy to do. It's easy to, to, oh, time to make the donuts. Time to get up to go to school. Time to get up to go to work. Got through my day. Time to eat dinner. Time to go to bed. Time to get up and make the donuts again. Are we allowing our knowledge of the sovereign grace of God to infect our lives? Give us beautiful feet. How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the gospel. God causes us to come to him. Caused, God chooses us through his sovereignty. We'll dwell forever with him. He'll give us eternal satisfaction as we spend eternity, eternity fathoming the depths of his goodness. His peace will reign. He does have the power. <clears throat> so we saw the God's both 
present providence and his eternal provision should drive us to worship. Back to our psalm, Psalm 93, verse 5. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. God's word is sure. We can have confidence in it. Psalm 93 talks about God's sovereignty. It's our king who guarantees the stability of the world against all forces of chaos, confirms the reliability of his word, and calls for worship from his people. It expresses three things that should be part of our lives. Joy, hope, and confidence in our omnipotent, omniscient, very present Lord. In the book of Hosea, God says his people perish for lack of knowledge. And we need to wrestle with these doctrines of the Reformation. We need to think theologically instead of logically. We need to think theologically rather than logically. Thinking logically brings us often to despair. Why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve this? What have we done to deserve anything better? We need to think like God thinks. Hebrews 6, 13 through 15 tells us that God made a promise to Abraham. But Abraham had to wait decades to obtain that promise. I'm sure Abraham had troubles during his life during that time. Yet he steadfastly waited for our God. We're told in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If we continue to abide in him, if we continue to work for him, through him, the same God who promises to establish the world and make, can make us unmovable, make us able to labor in spite of trials. Hebrews 6, 17 through 19 says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, the unchangeability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, two things that can never change, in which it was impossible for God to lie, you know, nothing is impossible with God except he cannot lie. We can always trust his word. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So we see we have a hope. We have an anchor of the soul or continuing the verse, excuse me, we have hope, we have as an anchor of a soul, both sure and steadfast. So we see two great theological truths here. God has an unchangeable purpose. God cannot lie. And, and related to that, he guarantees, he who cannot lie, guarantees that he's going to fulfill his purpose with an oath. According to Ezekiel chapter 3, God is control of all times and all seasons. Remember, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to mourn, there's a time for joy, there's a time to live, there's a time to die. All that we saw in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You know, sometimes there are rainy seasons and sometimes there are dry seasons. Sometimes life is hard, sometimes life is easy. The conclusion is God is in control of it all. You know, it's easy for us to, to believe and to praise God when, when life is peaches and green. It's easy for us to praise God when we're feeling well, our job is going well. We just got to raise. Our cups are overflowing. But it's much harder when we face adversity. When we face adversity, we, we tend to, to, to go into ourselves and, and think logically instead of theologically. Logical thinking often brings discouragement. Theological thinking, according to this passage, gives us three benefits. Number one, we can have strong consolation, it says. Personal encouragement. Abraham waited decades for God's promise of a son to come true, and yet he never thought God to be a liar. He had a consolation of, of God's faithfulness. Two, we have a hope set for it before us. And three, we have an anchor for our soul. It's sure and steadfast. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't lose our anchor is Jesus, the friend who sticks closer than a brother. Horrible things may happen. They might happen to us. Yet our sovereign God and our sovereign friend will never forsake us. Psalm 16, 11 promises that, that we will have pleasures at his right hand 
forevermore, for eternity. We need to keep focused on the prize. We need to think theologically. You know why? Because we can't lose. Our God reigns. Father, we thank you that you indeed reign, that you're sovereign over the universe, that you're sovereign in everything that happens. Father, though we may face difficult times and be saddened by it, yet we can have joy knowing that even in these, you're in control, you have a reason, and ultimately it's for our good and your glory. Father, help us to trust in you. Help us to, to realize that doctrine is not just something that we think about. It's something that we do. It's something that, we, that should be part of us. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. forgot to mention uh, in my sermon, just um, well, the Acts of Providence. Did you notice that the... the the choral selections that I had selected and the hymns that Pastor Spencer had selected, neither 